Hey guys, so if you're new here or if you're not, if you want to hear me voice act, head over to our main channel, links down below. And if you don't, this channel's solely for TTS. Um, if you want to know all the details about what's going on, we have a stream up that you can go and watch, but let's just get into the video. Aspect warriors are elder who have chosen to walk the path of the warrior and thus to defend their craft worlds from aggression and to destroy the enemies of the elder. They comprise the vast majority of the elder military and are separated into different branches called aspects, each one of which specializes in a certain method of killing things. Aspect warriors focus themselves to hone their martial abilities psychically, which creates a portion of their consciousness, called a war mask. This mental mask protects their minds against the horrors of war. This has the advantage of essentially protecting them from PTSD and turning them into stone-cold killers, even if they were raw recruits who have never fought in battle before. A war mask can be removed after the warrior has left the battlefield and he can return to his life as if nothing had happened afterwards. They don't remember what happened while wearing their war mask. Some have peeked behind the mask and been utterly horrified. Those who lose the ability to control it become exorches. This implies that the elder outside of the militant paths tend towards strongly compassionate emotions and being pussies. Excluding the seers anyway. As part of their training warlocks are forced to confront and reconcile all the horrors of war without a war mask, leaving only the dispassionate understanding of how necessary all the grimdark is. Anyway, due to elder anal retentiveness, sometimes they become utterly obsessed with their jobs, and aspect warriors can become incapable of separating their war masks from their everyday personalities. Such warriors are known as exorches, and they lead squads of aspect warriors. Despite their leadership roles and battery, other elder, and most exorches themselves, tend to pity and mourn them, as their original personalities are all but dead, supplanted by the battle focus of their war masks, incapable of any emotions not related to their aspect. Soul stones are placed in the armor of an exarch to collect his knowledge of war, and these stones are then passed to other exarches, so that the deceased warrior can share his knowledge and skills. In this way, exorches not only lose their personalities, but are also denied the proper afterlife of the Elder, such as it is. The rest of the Elder army is composed of guardians. These are not professional full-time soldiers, but rather civilian militia conscripted from other paths of the Elder. These individuals do not have a war mask and typically have their minds shielded by a warlock who has been an aspect warrior in the past to prevent the sensations of battle from overwhelming them, because seriously, who wants to stand beside a dedicated dreamer or mourner on the battlefield? In addition, guardians get assigned to more generalized or less hazardous tasks that aspect warriors would be wasted on. Aspect Warrior Types All aspect warriors fight according to one of the aspects of Kayla Mencha Cain, the elder god of war. Each aspect was founded by a warrior known as a phoenix lord, who serves as the ultimate embodiment of that aspect. Dire Avengers Dire Avengers were the first aspect warrior path, and the original founder of their temple was a sermon, the first phoenix lord. They are solid general purpose troops. In battle dire avengers operate in squads of 5 to 10 warriors, which sometimes includes an exarch, and can ride into battle within a wave serpent transport. These patient, methodical warriors are equally well suited for both offensive and defensive operations. Their training gives them the uncanny ability to read the ebb and flow of battle, knowing when to press the attack or feign retreat and fall back, luring their foes into a carefully prepared ambush. Dire Avengers are also trained in hand-to-hand -hand techniques though, with the exception of their exarches, this is not the main focus of their training. When forced to conduct close combat Dire Avengers carry deadly ceremonial knives as a weapon of last resort. These blades are more traditionally used in ceremonies conducted prior to and after battle. It is rare to find an elder force without a squad of these extravagant peacock heads at its heart. Because of their adaptability Dire Avengers are also the most common aspect warriors used to conduct special missions outside of normal combat. These can range from recovering an ancient artifact, aiding exodites from an incursion by greenskins to acting as bodyguards for a farseer to even conducting business with the Inquisition, who are sneaky, manipulative, and judgmental like the Elder. When not at war or embarked upon missions, the Dire Avengers spend much of their time at their aspect shrine, meditating upon battle, studying the tactics and strategies of their ancestors, and practicing their skills at arms. The ritual masks and armor that aspect warriors wear set them apart as the elite soldiers of their race. They represent Cain in his aspect as a noble warrior, which explains a ton since nobility honor aren't part of Cain's domain as a deity, unlike Korn. On the tabletop, a dire Avenger exarch can replace his Avenger shuriken catapulter gatekeeper's bastion with one of several options. The first option is to take two Avenger shuriken catapults, which performs exactly as you'd expect. 
The second and third options are to take a shuriken pistol, and either a dyer's word or a power glaive. The dyer's word is a power sword that causes mortal wounds on a wound roll of 6+, plus, while the power glaive adds plus 1 strength. The final option is to take a power glaive and a shimmer shield. Although this means the Exarch cannot use ranged weapons, aside from his plasma grenades, the entire squad gains a 5 plus invulnerable save. Dire Avengers have aspect armor, which gives them a 4 plus save, and like other aspect choices they are leadership aid. These stats are adequate. They also have a rule that gives them a 5 plus in overwatch, which can make them a less than tempting target in the charge phase. Although Dire Avengers can engage in melee if required, particularly if the Exarch has been upgraded to do so, this is not really their forte due to their low strength, low toughness, and low number of attacks. Therefore, you probably want to avoid melee in most situations. The real reason to take Dire Avengers is because of the 18 feet range of their Avenger Shuriken catapults. This extra range turns a meh weapon into a very good one, when combined with a battle focus ability, Dire Avengers have an effective threat range of up to 31 feet. As a final icing on the cake, like most Elder Infantry units Dire Avengers are also equipped with plasma grenades. Add in the squad's 3 plus BS on top of all this, and you have a resilient, flexible, highly mobile squad that can deliver a volume of highly accurate firepower to wherever it is most needed. Howling Banshees. The second aspect temple created was that of the Howling Banshees, founded by Jane's R. Their namesake comes from Elder mythology, in which Banshees are warp apparitions that foreshadow doom with their loud cries. As the story goes, Morai Heg, the crone goddess, wanted to drink her own divine blood and learn all of knowledge stored in it. But the only creature capable of harming a deity was Cain, who actually didn't want to help her out. So she sent her daughters to bitch and whine at Cain until he relented and cut off her hand to shut her up. In return, he kept ownership rights to the Banshees and created an aspect. In actuality, they were named when Jane Zar spent a night with Sly and Marbo. Howling Banshees specialize in melee combat and carry power swords and shuriken pistols. Each Banshee wears a Banshee mask, which amplifies the wearer's battle cries into a psychic scream that disorients targets, giving the Banshees the initiative and allowing them to live up to their namesake as the screaming harbingers of bloody murder. A Banshee Exarch may wield twin power blades, a power sword and a triskel, or a Badis Executioner, which is basically an Elder Power Naginata. High initiative, as high as slanish marked Chaos Base Marines, and power weapons make them big trouble for power armored foes. They are also a favored target of Fatih GI lusts due to their form fitting armor. Despite their feminine shaped armor and majority female members, men can join too, but they wear the female armor and adapt a female persona for the duration of their stay, so Fatih GIs are taking a heavy risk. On the tabletop, Howling Banshees have had a rough time of things since their 4th edition rules. This is due to being fragile at T3 with a 4 plus save, striking at S3 when their main targets, Marines, have a toughness of 4 or better, not having quite enough weight of attack to deal with large numbers of enemies, and having initiative and WS values only somewhat better than their targets of choice, and inferior to witches, who serve much the same role in Dark Elder armies. This is compounded by a lack of assault grenades to strike first against enemies in cover, or assault transports to bring them to their opponents safely. History follows like so. 6th edition slapped them hard right off the bat with the new power weapons rules, the many nerfs to assault, not being able to run, and charge was especially devastating, and a restriction that only allows them to bring swords. They got a lateral buff at best with a new book, which really didn't fix their old problems, but improved their competition, buffing scorpions a bit and introducing wraith blades. The exarches did get quite a lot better, but they have been reduced to glorified sergeants. The new 7th edition codex gave them a rather significant buff, they still didn't have plasma grenades, but could ignore cover when charging, and could charge further. Also, their masks suppressed overwatch fire, which helps them out quite a bit, especially against shooty folks like Tau, or units with multiple flamers. Furthermore, the entire Elder Book and indeed the meta as a whole really wasn't lacking for AP3 killing capacity, thus further ensuring that the primary role of Banshees in 7th was that of shelf decoration, a cruel fate for one of the most iconic Elder units. 8th edition changed them up by reintroducing the move stat which has finally allowed GW to do away with a million and one awkward rules that modified how fast a unit could move. The only remaining mystery is why they ever removed the move stat in the first place. With a movement stat of 8, being able to charge after advancing and getting 3 extra inches on their charge distance, Banshees can threaten anything within an average of 21 and a half inches. Or more if you pick the red and therefore fastest craft world. They also have outright immunity to overwatch, suck at Tau, and as long as the Exarch is in play, enemies have a minus one penalty to hit them in close combat. 
This means that most units will hit them on a 4 plus at best, and in combined with stratagems and psychic powers dealing with banshees in melee, can become pretty hard, to say the least. Unfortunately, for several editions now banshees have been let down by not having enough attacks, while also not having a high enough strength value to outperform similar units such as striking scorpions. With only two attacks base with S3 AP2 power weapon and a shuriken pistol, they struggle to kill their supposed intended target of mechs. Consider that against marines banshees, will hit two out of three times, wound only one out of three times, and will be deflected by the marines pauldrons one out of three times. Therefore a unit of 10 banshees, without an exurge, would statistically kill three models, meaning that they're rather shockingly bad at killing space marines. At this rate, it'll actually be the 42nd millennium before GW realizes that a space marine's toughness score is just as much a part of their defense as their armor save, and that S3 power weapons are exceedingly mediocre at killing marines without a lot of wounds to throw around. Though the 9th edition Craftworld Codex isn't out yet, GW did throw Howling Banshees a much needed bone. Their power swords now add plus one to their strength, letting them at least wound space marines 50% of the time, and rather easily butcher jack targets unaided. Now when buffed by warlocks, they can actually wound non-gravis space marines relatively reliably these days. Unfortunately, even the old marines now have two wounds apiece now, so with their two attacks per model, they're still rather lackluster against their intended targets. Additionally, while their ability to shut down overwatch remains, it's dramatically less useful this edition, since every non-tau army can only fire overwatch once per turn. Sure, you can lead with the Banshees against a particularly crucial target before sending in the Wraithblades, but depending on the circumstances there's a very real chance the opponent wasn't going to fire Overwatch anyways. Banshees need Psyker support or else basic bitch Necron warriors will tie up the Brides of Cain all game long. With Psyker support, they're definitely quite handy, and their Exurge is one hell of a brutal and killy melee beat stick. However, you might still be left wondering if your points aren't better spent on striking Scorpions or Wraithblades. That's debatable, but the fact is that Banshees are reasonably priced at 13 PTS model and serve their function well enough considering their cost. Try to use their amazing mobility and threat range to assassinate isolated, high-value targets and just try not to bite off more than they can chew. If you're using your unsupported squad of 6 Banshees to charge a fresh mob of 30 Orc boys, you're definitely doing it wrong. They represent Kane in his aspect as a harbinger of doom. They are now in plastic. Rejoice and cry for joy. Huzza, no tabletop RPG table is complete without beautiful models on the table and the best place to get models is from us, if you check the link below we have everything you could need for your magical realm only the finest of big titty wafers here, but if you're not into models or don't play with models we got you covered with subclasses such as the Gachimuchi wizard the simp warlock and the North FC fighter also we have started selling 5th edition adventures with our first one featuring Bella the fiend the succubus that's poisoned the town's well and turned the villagers into simps. If any of that stuff sounds fun to you go ahead and check the link below, but let's get back to the video. Striking Scorpions. The elder answer to corn berserkers and orc boys. Their founder was Ara, but he was said to have been too driven by murderous impulses, and so he went renegade and burned down the first aspect temple, the one belonging to a sermon. It was Karandras who took his place and tempered their killing rage with patience so that they became stalking serial killers instead. Compared to their closest cousins and fellow hoes, the Howling Banshees, Striking Scorpions are not as swift, but instead more adept at moving through dense terrain, using every available nook and crevice to lie in wait of the enemy before unleashing their attack. They are sneaky dudes with chainswords, shuriken pistols and mandiblisters built into their helmets. They can take a beating almost as well as they can dish it out. The Exurge can take either a Chainsaber or a bigger, batter Chainsword which grants plus 2 Zura Power Fisty Scorpion's Claw, which doesn't slow him like Mon K Fists, and with proper training the Exurge can hit with it as hard as Marines with their fists. You may wonder why are they so sneaky if they carry what counts as a jet engine on a sword? Well, the best and reasonable answer is that they can sneak up on you without you hearing their Chainswords. Because Elder Chainswords trigger only after making contact with the target. Because that is smarter than Mon K Chainsword design. This way the teeth won't rip and tear until they've already bitten into the target, unlike regular chainsaws which will probably deflect if they don't hit just right. The aspect armor of the striking scorpions is similar in construction to that of other aspect shrines, but incorporates heavier, rigid armor plating for increased protection. While the extra weights mean scorpions are not as swift as their howling banshee sisters, the protection they provide is such that even bolters are virtually useless against them, requiring concentrated fire from multiple weapons in order to bring down striking scorpions. The armor's coloring is predominantly green, with different patterns of yellow, black or orange depending on each individual shrine. 
striking scorpions represent Cain and his aspect as a silent hunter. They are also said to represent Gork and Mork in their aspect of being green, dead killy, art as nailed choppy daka murder machines. Being basically Elfgru 6 ninjas they are the closest thing the aspect warriors have to reasonable marines, although not quite so reasonable, as to stoop to using camocloaks like rangers do. As of 8th edition they do mortal wounds. I'm not shitting you. Intel, this only happens in the fight phase, where each 6 is a mortal wound. Fire dragons. Fire dragons are said to represent the mythical dragons who basically just destroyed everything indiscriminately. They specialize in destroying enemy war machines and fixed fortifications, as well as rooting out heavily armored infantry and weapon emplacements. In this role each fire dragons wields a mighty fusion gun, capable of reducing an enemy to a cloud of superheated vapor in a second, or a battle tank into a pile of molten slag. Against targets too tough for even these weapons the fire dragons carry melta bombs, disc-shaped bombs which can be attached to any surface and detonated on command. However, the short range of their weaponry limits the fire dragons' effectiveness, especially when speed and tactical flexibility are needed. It is also the reason fire dragon aspect armor is thicker compared to a dire avengers, including many spiny protrusions which make it stiffer and more resilient, so that the wearer can properly close with the enemy and deliver death and destruction upon them. Fire Dragon armor is painted in fiery colors, such as red or orange. Despite being scary mofos, they seem to be inconsistent in their fluff. From the aforementioned fiery death machines as mentioned above, to incompetent idiots whose fusion guns are so ineffective that they couldn't even get passed through a hastily constructed barricade made from scrap metal and cardboard, then again this was written by a certain Irish leper. If they get within 12 inches of anything AV14 and below, it's going to blow up within the turn. Dragons are armed with either a fusion gun, which operates like an imperial meltagun, or a fire pike, which is basically a long-range fusion gun. Their exarch can also take a dragon's breath flamer weapon, but only if he wants to lose his only use on the battlefield. They also carry melta bombs to allow them to take out tanks on the charge. Their phoenix lord, Fugan, is the bestest tank destroyer out there, better even than railguns and Lehman Russ vanquishers. He's also a beatstick in CC, carrying a burning axe that lets him fight like a monstrous creature. An often overlooked aspect, pun not intended, of fire dragons, is that they train in demolition, sabotage, anti-tank warfare, i.e., identifying the weak spots of armored vehicles and fortifications, and siege warfare. They represent Cain in his aspect as a force of destruction. Fucking Otterches. Dark Reapers. The story goes, the Cain once battled the Nightbringer and wounded him. The injury caused shards of the Ktans, being to migrate into the psyche of all of the races of the galaxy, except orcs, instilling the fear of death in all mortals. And according to the ancient tome known as Wikipedia, this urgent fear of death was what eventually precipitated the birth of the Chaos Gods, causing the very grimdark the 40k universe feeds on in the first place, way to go, Cain. In return, these shards pierced Cain's body and he gained a new aspect as the Destroyer. The Phoenix Lord Mogan Ra founded this aspect, which is a bit weird, because Ra himself handles absolutely nothing like his aspect. He was said to be obsessed with death and stood apart from his fellow Phoenix Lords in that respect. Dark Reapers are something like a hybrid of Dire Avengers and Fire Dragons. Use them to kill mechs and AV-10 all-around vehicles. The Exarch can take a big missile launcher of the type only seen on support platforms or Wraith Lords, but with more DACA. On the tabletop, Dark Reapers are essentially a squad of AP-3 heavy bolters with T3, good accuracy, and a 3-plus save. This means that their Reaper launchers makes them very good against mechs and have the range and weight of fire to be dangerous to lighter, but more numerous infantry and annoy heavier infantry, as well as 3 plus save monstrous creatures. The Exarch can either use a shuriken weapon, never do this, or a missile launcher that he can double tap and has all the same warheads as its Imperial counterpart, with the exception of the frag warhead being replaced by the better plasma warhead. Dark Reapers are good at what they do, but they face competition from other Elder Heavy support considering cover saves are now everywhere, the entire Codex is now excellent at Marine slaying, and their slot is shared with the more versatile Warwalkers, Wraith Knights, Fire Prisms, Night Spinners, other assorted Forge World Elder Tanks, and Vol's Wrath Batteries. The Elder Heavy support slot can be filled with excellent units, and each of your three six slots are precious. So while the Dark Reaper is by no means bad, it's a good unit that has to compete with a lot of excellent units. 6th edition brought back something they haven't had since 2nd, crack missiles. With long-range anti-tank missiles available, and an increase in squad size, their scores just went up. Of course, you can now throw the fuck out the window, or, even better, use the aspect host for plus 1 BS, so have fun with them. As of 8th edition, they are possibly one of the best heavy support units in the game. 
Regardless of all two hit buffs on the enemy or deb is thrown on them, they gained a special rule that specifically states that they always hit on a 3 plus. Period. Considering they have either single hitting S8 shots or multi hitting S5 blasts, that do multiple wounds per hit, they can effectively end most non horde infantry and vehicles downwind of them. They represent Kane in his aspect as inescapable death. Shining Spears. Space Jousters in Spes. Shining Spears are the fastest and most specialized aspect, striking at ridiculous speeds and withdrawing in a flash. Shining Spears can be distinguished from all of the other Elder Warrior aspects for they are the only aspect warriors to make use of anti-gravity jetpacks. The Shining Spears carry the fight directly to the enemy, pouncing upon them without warning to deliver a killing blow. Until recently, nobody knew their Phoenix Lord, but he has since been named as Drastanta. He went missing after the fall of the first aspect temple, so you still can't use him on the tabletop. While Shining Spear squads are relatively small, just 3 to 5 warriors, a number which sometimes includes an exurge to lead them, their mastery of the Elder Jetpack is so complete that each one can execute complex high-speed maneuvers with but a single gesture. In this way even a small unit of Shining Spears can turn the tide of battle, delivering a devastating charge against the enemy before wheeling around for another attack, much like Exodite Dragon Knights. The Shining Spears possess a bright and clear virtue that marks each one out as a warrior hero and a champion of the Elder Race. Elder mythology is replete with examples of noble heroes at one with their steed, and in the Shining Spears, the glories of legend are made manifest once more. Exarches wear more elaborate and ornate versions of Exarch armor which incorporates the spirits of their past wearers, granting an Exarch not only wisdom and knowledge stretching across the millennia, but a raw pool of potent psychic energy that can be used in combat. Shining Spears ride jetpacks into battle and wield laser lances, unusual power weapons last gun hybrids, and the Exarch can take a star lance for a more powerful stat line. They represent Kane in his aspect as a light speed blade. Reroll is a great app available on the Apple and Google Play Store as well as desktop for creating beautiful 8-bit character art. The app has 14 supported races, 150 plus weapons, 400 plus armor pieces for you to mix and match, 20 plus mini bases. There is that much to work from I was able to make Cold Steel the Hedgehog, the God Emperor of Mankind, Pepe and they are always adding more artwork. The app also has a character sheet to help keep track of everything during games. And if that wasn't enough you can play about with the app for free with limited artwork. So go ahead check it out, and if you decide to buy the app use promo code McBeardia for 10% off, and it also lets them know we sent you, it's a great sponsor and a great app, and we hope you guys go ahead and check it. But let's get back to the video. Swooping Hawks. In Elder Mythology, Hawks point out those marked by guilt so that everyone will know their crimes and judge them accordingly. Of all the aspect shrines the Swooping Hawks are among the most mobile, thanks to their winged Husser Swooping Hawk wings, which allow them to lift off into the air at a moment's notice and fly across the battlefield. The speed and agility this gives the Swooping Hawks more than makes up for the fact that their aspect armor, compared to that worn by other shrines, is thinner and offers less protection. The armor is typically colored like the sky, such as a pale blue or gray, with contrasting colors as well, especially on the wings. They are armed with a las blister and the swooping hawk grenade pack, while the Exarch will arm themselves with a power weapon for close quarters combat or replace his las blister for a sun rifle or hawk's talon. The phoenix lord of the swooping hawks is Behareth, who was said to have been the sermon's finest pupil, which is derp, since on the tabletop he's probably the most mediocre of all the phoenix lords. Once used only for yo-yo grenade bombing, Hawks are now kings of glancing vehicles to death, being fast, decently armored, and equipped with haywire grenades. With a new codex update, they can grenade bomb, while perfectly deep striking, and their elder flashlights became surprisingly terrifying through the sheer number of shots they deliver. They are noted to be transported by a special elder craft called a shooting star which ferry swooping Hawk aspect warriors onto a planetary battlefield. They briefly enter a planet's atmosphere, where they remain undetected due to a complex cloaking system that masks them from enemy scans. Once in the atmosphere, their cargo hold of swooping hawks free fall to the surface before the shooting stars return to their craft world. They represent Kane in his aspect as a precise predator. Warp Spiders. Warp Spiders are named for the beings of pure energy that inhabit the infinity circuit and travel through its links in the webway, purging it of foreign influences, such as demons or psychic intruders. Though they are identified as aspect warriors, it is not entirely known what Kane's connection to the warp spiders is, since they do not have a fixed phoenix lord, and it has been established in Gavthorpe's Paths of the Elder series that Kane's influence has no place in the webway, which in fact is why exarches and phoenix lords count as mini infinity circuits on their own. 
C.S. Godot's contentious book Elder Prophecy presented Lycosity, whose armor materialized spontaneously at the Warp Spider's shrine during a time of crisis, when he was most needed, rather than being a suit of armor that gets passed from bearer to bearer, adding personalities to the sentience within the suit. If Lycosity is a phoenix lord born of the webway, then his personality would have to be the just all consciousness of the entire species. Fucking Godot. That said, his title is Wraith Spider, not Phoenix Lord, so, at least for now, we can readily get away with rejecting the idea that he's a Phoenix Lord. The Elder's premier jetpack infantry, Warp Spiders use the warp to teleport from place to place, allowing them to strike at their enemies from virtually any location in the blink of an eye. Their guns are called Death Spinners, which fire a mist of monomolecular threads that expand and slice through flesh and light infantry armor on contact with little effort. All this makes the spiders fairly unreliable against power armored units since the spinner's threads can't penetrate it properly, although they get an AP1 version of the Bladestorm rule, why AP1, when that only matters against vehicles is anyone's guess, they are nevertheless a frightening foe against the likes of guardsmen and gaunts, and are surprisingly effective against vehicles, especially if they get to their vulnerable rear armor, which is not a big deal with such mobility. Their exarch is given two death spinners which are attached to the back of his armor for mobility, or a single spinneret rifle for anti-armor punching, as well as two power blades which he holds for close combat, though on the tabletop, he's generally outclassed in assault by any unit that can melee better than a guardsman. Guardsman.may represent Kane in his aspect as an eternal guardian of the Elder and Webway. Shadow Spectres. The Shadow Spectres are a newer aspect, thought lost until the armor of their phoenix lord, Irelith, was recovered from an imperial world, as chronicled in Forge World's Imperial Armor Vol. 11, The Doom of Mimira, and is noted to be one of the most derp of the phoenix lords. They fly around on jetpacks and wear hollow fields, making them look kind of like ghosts, if ghosts also shot prismatic lasers of doom. Their weaponry is fairly high strength as infantry weapons go, especially for fast attack infantry, and they can combine their beams into a super beam of death that gets more powerful as more of them join it, in fact, the technology is the same as the fire prism's main cannon. Their exarch on the other hand, mounts the even bigger and longer prism blasters. The shadow specters make use of a unique, complex targeting matrix known as the ghost light. This matrix further amplifies the effective range and power of the warrior's already formidable weaponry. When used, the ghost light will allow a specter squad to combine the beams of their prism rifles into a single brilliant torrent of energy. The additional power allows the squad to fire a single incredibly long-ranged shot, allowing them to hit distant targets. Between their ghost-like appearance and name, and their tendency to become Wraithguard after they die, they represent Kane's aspect as an eternal warrior, even after death. TLDR, Shadow Specters are essentially the Dark Reapers of vehicles. Unfortunately, the 7th edition Codex has enshrined Warp Spiders as the elder solution to jetpack infantry, which is clearly why Forge World invented these guys. 8th edition gave these guys quite the overhaul. They've lost their ghost light abilities, but can fire their prism rifles multiple times in the coherent mode, as long as they keep landing their shots. They also shifted into the elite category for some reason. 9e once again revamped these guys, though not as dramatically as prior editions. Gone is their ability to shoot their coherent mode again after each successful shot, maximum of 3 total, instead just dealing d3 damage. Though it still provides rather inconsistent damage output, it's considerably less swingy as a result. Additionally, their dispersed mode no longer auto-hits, but instead is now an 18 feet d6 shot blast weapon designed to clear away hordes and jack targets. They also remembered how to deep strike like their phoenix lord. Crimson Hunters. I feel the need, the need for speed. Top Gun. A fairly new aspect, but one on the rise. Rather than a blade or a gun the hunters use a jet fighter called the Nightshade Interceptor. No Phoenix Lord has been mentioned for them. It's possible the Eagle Pilots, who are a barely detailed aspect shrine devoted to void warfare, have a Phoenix Lord named Amon Herrick. If they exist, they might be the Phoenix Lord for the Crimson Hunters as well, but probably Amon Herrick is just the Eldari name for fighter pilot, since it's listed in the Eldari lexicon as meaning that, in which case no Phoenix Lord is known for them either. Crimson Hunters are trained to become exceptional pilots, endlessly practicing all sorts of maneuvers as well as marksmanship. The Crimson Hunters' nightshades are armed with two bright lances and a pulse laser. The Crimson Hunters are few in number, though their shrines are becoming more widespread. These temples of Cain are unlike any other for they are tunnel-like collections of transparent atriums that float around the periphery of their craft worlds, allowing the Crimson Hunters and their recruits to freely train in their aircraft. Crimson Hunters are known to give special veneration to the Elder God Kernus, often calling themselves the Hawks of Kernus. Crimson Hunters are known to give some Elder Penis Envy with them being the only aspect able to pilot a pretty cool jet fighter, while the rest are bogged down on the ground. 
As a side effect, they have even smaller balls than the already almost ballast species of the Elder. They represent the blinding blades of Cain, which were forged from the blood that constantly drips from his hands. They strike at the weakest points and leave the enemy easy prey for the close kill, therefore bringing down foes who think themselves above him. The unknowns. Whether these are actually aspect temples, have been reckoned out, or were once supposed to be something, nobody knows. Eagle Pilot, mentioned in Shadow Point, in one sentence, and never again. It says only the aspect warrior path of Amon Herrick, or Well guys hope you enjoyed today's video we are going to assume you have, if you have stayed to the end, consider subscribing and clicking the notification bell, if you really enjoyed it to stay up to speed with any and all new videos. Also check out the links below to our shop for some fat ass titties, and our sponsor reroll and make sure to use the promo code at checkout, to let them know we sent you, and until next time.